А, видно? Видно, да, видно. Видно, видно? Хорошо, ну тогда начинать? Да, да. Сейчас только. Виден ваш экран, а вас совсем не видно. Это ну, меня... Я вижу. Видишь, да? Да, я, я вот вижу Сережу, Пашу и тебя. Хорошо. Ладно. Ну и себя, но это не считается. Паш, вы, Паш, вы видите Сережа? Сейчас пойму, по-моему, по-моему, экран тут. А, нет, вижу, вижу. Все видно. Видно, угу. видно. Нет, он должен, когда там на спикер вью там или что-нибудь, он должен быть, а у меня почему-то Миша Бернштейн. Это потому что... Потому что Миша последним говорил, а сейчас Сережа начнет говорить, и у тебя все включится. Ну, хорошо, ладно, тогда все, начинаем. Хорошо, ну, большое спасибо за приглашение, я весьма признателен за эту возможность сделать мой первый семинар в России и первый семинар на русском языке. Я, а, я сейчас, может быть, Сереж, вас огорчу. Не, не надо, не надо, пусть Сережа порадуется, и я заодно. Ну, подожди, нет, мы не будем. Нет, у нас есть правило, что если... Ну, пока это... никого не было. Не было? Да, есть, я вроде бы. Ну, есть вообще-то. Уже есть, да? Да, Клод. Окей. Он же понимает по-русски, нет? Uh, well, I can switch at any moment. Yes? В общем, уже не первый семинар, он здесь мог бы и научиться. Right. Ну, ладно. So, Сереж, um... нет. Сереж, у нас правило, если есть в аудитории англоговорящий, то мы yeah, правильно. Okay. Yes. Uh, so, um, let me start with the story. Um, because, as I understand, this is a mixed audience, I decided to orient the first part of the talk, uh, being mostly physics-oriented, providing outlook outlining various string theory dualities and uh, relevant gauge theories. And the second part will be uh, mathematical, which will contain precise theorems and results which follow from studying both. So in particular, the first picture was there to illustrate that instantons are four dimensional objects and as a result, they live up in the sky and bows are one dimensional object. So corresponding transforms from instantons to bows Uh, they go down, so this is down transform, and going from bows to instantons will be up transform. So our goal will be today just uh, describing and understanding these transforms and then using them to study moduli spaces of instantons. Let me first put this problem in the context. Uh, bows themselves is just the first step in generalizing quivers, and there are other generalizations. So in particular, You can think of quivers as combinatorial object, which allows you to combine, um, in a sense, linear algebra data. Next step is bows, which involve uh, uh, ODEs, ordinary differential equations. Next is slings. And the next one will involve decorated Newton polygons. In terms of geometry, each of these corresponds to certain type sorry, of geometry. Sorry, sorry, what is slings in Russian? Прощи. Прощи. Uh, если квиверы это некоторые алгебраические уравнения, uh, if quivers are uh, algebraic equations, bows, uh, ODs, and slings are PDs, for example, Hitchin systems. Uh, and then polygons will correspond to various monopoles, as I'll mention. Yes, any other questions? So in terms of geometry, whenever the associated geometry is four-dimensional, it corresponds to a gravitational instanton. And the distinction will be by what kind of asymptotic that um, gravitational instanton has, or in other words, how far from being compact it is. So quivers deliver ALE geometries, bows ALF, slings ALG, and the rest ALH. These also correspond to objects in classical gauge theory, to um, solitons and dynamics of solitons. So quivers, roughly speaking, correspond to instantons, bows to monopoles, slings to periodic monopoles, and 
next step is doubly periodic monopoles. Uh, these are, in a sense, just place, placeholders, and they have various manifestations. For example, if you study colorons, you can also get a lifetime geometries. And also, there is a quantum manifestation of these in terms of quantum gauge theory. The corresponding objects describe their spaces of vacuum. So, for supersymmetric quantum chromodynamics, for example, quivers are very good at describing its Higgs branches and bows, slings, and uh, these decorated Newton polygons or W periodic monopoles are good at describing uh, their Coulomb branches. And as we will see today, bows are also quite good in connecting the two and understanding um, mirror symmetry so that um, using bows, one can make it exact. Uh, usually mirror symmetry interchanges the two branches, Higgs and Coulomb branches of vacua, but uh, the way it is usually formulated, it does not preserve the metric on the modular space. Uh, in today's formulation, it will. So it will be exact in that sense. Let me take a minute to just describe this gravitational instantons because it's such an interesting subject and it's a good use of uh, quivers and, uh, and bows. So gravitational instanton as notion was introduced by Hawking in his formulation of Euclidean quantum gravity. And for him, these were the minima of Einstein-Hilbert action for pure gravity. So gravitational instanton will be a four-dimensional Riemannian manifold whose Riemann curvature tensor is self-dual. And of course, for this to have physical sense, we also require it to have finite action. Well, in this case, because it's self-dual, you can just require finite Pantragin number. If you look for compact gravitational instantons, then these come only in two kinds. There's flat four torus and there is K3. If you step away from compact case, then you can distinguish the spaces by how fast the volume of a large ball of radius R grows with radius. The maximal volume growth is R to the fourth, and that case is called ALE. The next in the ascent to K3 is a cubic volume growth, and that is an ALF space. And it's the theorem that there is no volume uh, growth uh, rate anywhere in between. Well, what does this abbreviation mean? Well, some of them do mean something and some of them don't. So ALE stands for asymptotically locally Euclidean. ALF stands for asymptotically locally flat. And everything else doesn't stand for anything. About K3, there are different arguments. Uh, so uh, ALG has volume LG growth. ALG stands for algebraic geometry, no? It's up to you. Uh, it's good to, to ignite the imagination. So um, ALG has quadratic or higher volume growth below three. At the moment, there is no theorem that there are no uh, rates between two, strictly above two and strictly less than three. But I suspect this is true, that there is nothing in between. But for ALH, there are. And so ALH is anything which volu where volume growth grows uh, less than quadratic. And the, the higher we go, the more interesting functions begin to appear as you study the metric. Uh, so the Ailey case was uh, decisively studied by Kronheimer and all, all Ailey spaces appear as um, A, D, O, E type. And you can think of them as four dimensional flat space divided by discrete subgroup of SU2 and then you resolve the singularity. Uh, ALF spaces, on the other hand, come in two kinds, A or D, and uh, these metrics are found in these works. And uh, uh, it is very active subject now studying ALG, ALH spaces, but for our purposes today, and uh, to avoid various technicalities, I'll focus on uh, this multi tau knot case, A type ALF, as the main focus, mostly because the metrics are so easy to write. And the metrics in this form that I'll present today were found by Gibbons and Hawking. The other metrics are not so much more complicated, but they are written in terms of elliptic functions, 
instead and involves some elliptic constraint. So let me focus on multi tab nut and describe what it is. Serious. Usually there is, even when you write the metric in explicit formula, it's a question about real singularities of this metric, about this horizon and so on. Do we assume that the solution is smooth or, or, yes. it, is, or it is smooth after some certain local change of variables? So what, what's the assumption about metric? Yes, this is an excellent question. And in a sense, the whole intricacy of the subject is trying to find Riemannian manifolds with completely smooth metrics. When you study the modular spaces, that is when you start varying various parameters, you can see that in this space, there can be various degeneration. For example, Kronheimer's metrics correspond to Kleinian singularity, C2 mod gamma, which can be fully resolved. So I would like, I, I like to view this subject as trying to find completely smooth and complete metric on, on the space. From all these, I remember there was a bunch of, at least formally, soliton type solutions constructed by Belinsky and Zaharov. Yes. And so in particular, the Staub note metrics fall in, in their list. Any use of them or they're all singular because the study of their singularity, as far as I remember, was open. Yes, so they had a very wide class and from what I remember, they also have not necessarily a Riemannian signature. So uh, their metrics deliver all sorts of interesting dynamics and indeed they, they uh, from what I remember last talking to Vladimir Evgenievich, these metrics involved propagating singularities, uh, propagating and interacting waves. Um, in this case- Maybe, maybe, maybe with Minkowski signature. Because... That's right, that's right. And in this case, I'm staying strictly in Euclidean signature to keep, to keep subject purely hyperkelly domain. Uh, any you. other questions? And so, and you say that in Euclidean signature, uh, there is no such phenomenon like uh, false singularities, yeah? Well, as we will see in a moment, there, there is such a thing. There, there are apparent singularities. And in fact, in the very first example, the one you see right now, there will be one. Mm -hmm. So let us start with the, with the first warm-up case, which is flat Euclidean R4. And what I'm going to do right now is introduce radial coordinates on R4. Just as in radial coordinates on the plane, um, there is apparent singularity at the origin. So let, let's start with R4. We identify R4 with a, with a line of quaternions. So they will be quaternionic units, E1, E2, and E3, with usual quaternionic relations. They will square to minus one, and E1 times E2 is E3. Now, if I pick one of them, let's say E1, I can write any quaternion as pure imaginary quaternion times exponent of E1, times tau. And tau, of course, has periodicity two pi. So this is almost it. This is like uh, writing, writing my quaternion in radial coordinates. Sorry, and what is pure imaginary? It means that uh, conjugate, quaternionic conjugate of A is minus A. Oh, okay, thank you. So A bar equals minus A. Uh, except instead of A as my radial coordinate, it's more convenient to look at this combination. You can see that this combination is indeed invariant under changing the angle tau. This combination is also pure imaginary, and I'll write it as T, and T as a result can be thought of as a vector in three-dimensional space. So these are the radial coordinates on R4. There's an angle, and there's a point in three-dimensional space. If you look at the Euclidean metric on R4, dq dq bar, in this radial coordinate, it looks like this. Let us check that it makes sense geometrically. 
So suppose I stand somewhere on R4 and I change tile. You can think of R4, for example, as two complex planes. If I change tau, then I'm rotating both planes sim simultaneously. So as a result, I get a circular orbit. So what we described here is vibration. So if you have some fixed radius, then you have a three-dimensional sphere and you fiber it by circles parameterizing, parameterized by tau. What you obtain is simply hop vibration. Tau parameterizes the fiber and two sphere in R3 parameterizes the base. As we go to infinity, the fiber grows and becomes infinitely large. As you can see, when, tau, when t goes to infinity, denominator goes to zero. So overall, the size of the fiber will, will grow infinitely large, as we expect. When t goes to zero, on the other hand, denominator blows up and the circle shrinks, just as we expect in radial coordinates. You can also see that there is apparent singularity at the origin. And this is purely a coordinate singularity because we know that our metric is just flat, R4. Okay, any, any questions here? Once we wrote things in this form, it's actually very easy to see what happens next. There. And that's the, the generalization of um, Gibbons and Hawking. Instead of allowing the size of the circle go to infinity as, as uh, radius increases, we can require that our sphere, S3 at infinity, Hopf sphere, is actually squashed, that the fiber stabilizes and goes to a certain size as the base keeps growing. All we have to do is substitute, in, instead of this function one over uh, t, use the function constant plus one over t. So as a result, when t is very small, these metrics become very close to each other. This, this constant will not matter at all. So for t small, you indeed require nearly a flat space in this, in this coordinates. And when t, is very, when t is very large, then your circle stabilizes. One way of seeing this is that if you imagine a ray in three-dimensional space going from the origin, if you stand at any point away from the origin, over that point, there is a circle. And as you approach the origin, the size of that circle shrinks to zero. So above the ray in three-dimensional space, we have this cigar-shaped infinite cycle. In four-dimensional space? In the four dimensions. That's right. So our, our space has a projection on three dimensions. Generic fiber is a circle. And if we look at the pre image of a ray going from the origin, then you get a cigar. This cigar is manifestation of the plane in four dimensional space passing through the origin. So if you think of four dimensional spaces, C cross C, then this is manifestation of one of that. C factors. And if you take a ray pointing the other direction, that would be the other C factor. Uh, is it easy to check that this is a solution to the Einstein equation? Yes, indeed. Of course, the easiest, well, that's right. It is, uh, there, there's two ways uh, one can check. One can compute this directly, or one can describe the hyperkähler structure on this space. And every hyperkähler manifold in four dimensions solves Einstein equations automatically because its curvature is so dual. But it is a pleasant calculation to actually compute a levi chivita connection on this and compute the metric. One of the main advantages of having it in this form is realizing that the only thing that really matters in the calculation. In fact, as you check that this curvature is self-dual, you realize the only thing that really matters is that this omega, the way the circle is fibered, is related to V by, by a duality. The, the, 
related to each other by curl of omega is the gradient of V. As a result, V has to be harmonic. So what Gibbons and Hawking realizes is that there are other harmonic functions you can use and you would still have gravitational instanton. So they introduced lots of different centers in R3 and kept the metric in this form. And instead of V picked superposition of one of a, a radius contribution for various centers, U1, U2 and so forth. That is called the multi toed nut. As a result, this space now has non-trivial topology. If you take an interval connecting, let's say one tau nut center with another, then the image of that interval will be a sphere. For generic point, it's a circle, but circle shrinks at one end of the interval and the other end of the interval. That is the reason it is called a k minus one ALF, because for k centers, they can be k minus one intervals connecting them and they intersect according to a type. Denton diagram. Okay. Any questions? Uh, it seems that this is a kind of multi soliton solutions found by uh, Zachary Bilinski. Am I right or wrong completely? I do not think so. You don't think so. When you say, when you say solitons, solitons of which equation? No, just Einstein with some radial symmetry, I don't remember. But there was a last representation for this equation, and it was ages ago, but I remember they constructed formally solutions in a way as solid. But the problem was just to the singularity. I just wonder, I don't claim anything. Is it one of them or it's a completely new solution? This solution is completely smooth and well, it's relatively, it, I wouldn't call it new. This is the solution found by, by uh, Gibbons and Hawking. Uh, strictly speaking, and that's the reason it's called Taub now, that was found by Newman, Unti and Tamburino and by Taub, the AP and the full classification of such spaces. But it was written in this form by Gibbons and Hawking and interpreted as gravitational instant. Thank you. So the, re the reason I describe this place, the space in detail, is because we will study now. This will be our playground, and we will be now studying instantons, young Mills instantons on that space. I, I'm, I'm sorry. You said that V must be harmonic, but like in which sense? Like, well, it satisfies the Laplace equation outside of these points. Like second derivative is zero. Well, yeah, some of uh, three three dimensional uh, three dimensional ah, uh, three dimensional ah, Laplace equation, yeah. Yes, if you take this equation and take exterior derivative of it, left hand side will vanish, and right hand side will be Laplacian of v. Thank you. All right. So next in our story is the Young Milson talk. So young mills instanton is a bundle with a connection. In local trivialization, you can think of it given by connection one form. That's what, uh, what the gauge field is. And it has curvature, yeah, which is expressed easily through the form. And uh, young, mills, uh, uh, young Mills action is simply the L2 norm of the curvature. Of course, it's extrema are young Mills equations for which we don't have so many solutions. And in quantum theory, roughly speaking, you're interested in this type of integrals where you integrate over the fields of some function of, of the cage field um, weighted by the action. In Euclidean version, this integral looks like this. And as a result, it's dominated by minima of the action and by uh, by the method of Belavin, Polikov, Schwartz, and Tupkin, who first discovered uh, presented solutions for instantons, you can see that uh, this quantity is essentially L2 norm of F plus F star, so it has to be non negative. And you can express it in terms of Young Mills action and the purely topological term. So as a result, 
Young mill section is bounded below by a churn, uh, by a churn character value on M. And clearly, this inequality is saturated when this vanishes. So it, it, it is saturated for instantons or under self dual or self dual connections. So, what we will be after today, well, just to give an example, quaternionic formalism gives a very nice way of writing the connection found by Bilal and Polikov, Schwartz, and Tukin, the one, one instant on four dimensional space. And it's essentially imaginary part of x bar x. So x is our four dimensional space parameterized by quaternion x plus rho squared absolute value of x squared. You can also change its position by shifting x by b. So as a result, you have a five parameter family, which has an instant on size and a position. Then there were various generalizations of this and the, the logical triumph of this studies was the construction of a tier Hitchin, Greenfield, and Manning of all instantons on four dimensional space. So the goal for today will be constructing instantons on Taubnat space. In fact, one can construct using these methods, instantons, all instantons on ALF spaces, and find the metric on the modular space. So that completes the motivation. And now we'll start with first physical picture of how we can approach this problem. Are there any questions? Just to understand your aim. So if we come back to this flat case, yeah? So what will be the result uh, similar to what you want to show to us? So when you speak, uh, speaking ab uh, about instant on modular space, you mean uh, compact, non-compact, what? That's right. So if we look at instantons on R4, yes. then the, the answer to the first question is ADHM construction. Mm -hmm. And the answer to the second question would be, so in four dimensional space, we would have this uh, partial compactification of Ullenbeck and uh, the corresponding metric induced by ADHM. Mm -hmm. um, so in, in our case, as it turns out, I can tell a little more. I can give explicit expression for killer potential on this uh, modern space. And for this uh, metric on Ullenbeck uh, compactification, uh, is it known something explicit or? Well, there, there are various cases. So uh, for one instant on Taubnat, for example, in my first paper on the subject, I compute the metric very explicitly. And for all other cases, I will give the expression for killer potential. And uh, let me put it this way. All the answers will be explicit up to one uh, constraint involving, um, involving Abel's function. So a certain sum of Abel's functions equal to constant. And this function depend on more parameters than there, is, there are coordinates. So let's say for, for metric on four dimensional space, you would have five coordinates and they're related by an elliptic constraint. Mm -hmm. That's as explicit as it gets. Mm -hmm. okay. So let us now do some physics to get some sense of what the answer might look like. So uh, in a sense, in my view, the main power of, of, of string theory is that it, it provides one string theory picture allows for many different equivalent descriptions. And as a result, this can be used to, to solve our problem in some dual equivalent terms. So uh, the D brain of string theory is, if you like, a defect which carries within its world volume a young Mills excitations. So the D6 brain is a seven dimensional object, six plus one dimensional object, and inside of it, there is a young Mills gauge theory. Then Douglas's observation, Michael Douglas observed that if you have a co-dimension four object within, then you can represent it as an instanton in the larger dimensional brain. For example, if you're interested in instantons on R3 crosses circle, 
then you can insist on the transverse space having geometry r3 across a circle. And once you have a circle, you also have T duality. So T dualizing D6 brain along the circle turns it into a D5 brain. If you have two of them, so if your theory is SU2, of the T duality, you get a pair of, of D5s. Now, if you put an instant on inside, that is an object of co-dimension four inside, after T duality, because this is transverse to the circle, this D2 brain becomes D3 brain, which wraps the circle. What this picture describes essentially is a zero size instanton inside of T6. But also this picture allows you to understand what the size of an instanton actually uh, mean. Namely, D3 brain can end on D5. And that means that this brain wrapping the circle can actually split into two pieces. And roughly speaking, the distance between the two components is the size of an instanton on the other side. So it's that parameter rho in, uh, in the solution that I showed you. So that would be a study of, of colorons or periodic instantons, but we're interested in instantons on Taubnat space. So we need to understand what happens with Taubnat under T duality. Again, usual portion rules by uh, performing the T duality it allows us to identify Taub nut space with its T dual, which is an NS5 brain. So now, if you combine these ingredients, if you want to describe the instant on Taub nut after T duality, we have this picture, which involves vertical D5 brains, transverse NS5, and D3 essentially wrapping the circle. And this is known as Hanani, Chalmers Hanani width configuration. So if we want to understand the dynamics of these instantons or construct these instantons, then we might benefit from studying this configuration. Now, in order to get some concrete results instead of just pictures, we need good description of this juncture, for example. And to make it clearer, we can move to another branch. That is, let's experiment with it a little. Let's make D3 brains coincide and then move them away from D5. Both of them are D brains and the name D stands for Dirichlet. So these are Dirichlet boundary conditions for streams. And then you study string theory as a result in the presence of D, of D brains, you can have string modes. You can have strings stretching from one D brain to another. So by quantizing this string with these boundary conditions, you will get a massive hypermultiplet whose mass is proportional to this distance, essentially tension of the string times this length. So in the right picture, you can see that you have some string excitation, which is fundamental in fundamental representation of one gauge group and anti fundamental representation of another gauge group and has a mass. So if you want to move back to this picture, then you send the mass to zero. And if you want to separate the two D3 brains, that is equivalent to giving some vacuum expectation value to this fundamental multiple. So the moral of this exercise was that if you want to describe this juncture, you should include some massless uh, fundamental multiples who's, uh, who receive some expectation value. Uh, once again, this is sort of a physics prelude. All this will be done, it will be made exact in a matter of minutes, and become mathematical theory. With NS5 brain, life was a little harder. Right away, it's hard to guess what, how to describe NS5 next to D5, because string theory description involves this relatively non-local backgrounds. However, if you perform the same experiment, you might get a good hint of what is happening. You move D3 so it intersects on S5, and then you can split it. Here, you can clearly see that there is a, another string state, which is now bifundamental, it transforms as fundamental of one, fundamental of another. And again, it has a mass given by the splitting. So in the first case, we have massive 
fundamental multiplet. Now we have massive by fundamental multiplet. If you go back, you make it massless. And if you go here, you give it some expectation then. So again, so far, this is some impressionistic physics picture. But the moral of this picture is this, that if you study theory on D3 brain, then in the bulk, it is simply maximally supersymmetric angles. When it meets the D5, it has a fundamental matter localized at this co-dimension one plane. And when it crosses NS5, it has a bifundamental matter localized on another plane. So in fact, it is this theory, four-dimensional theory with such inhomogeneities, with planes of such defects that allows exact mirror symmetry. But isn't it true that already from the beginning of such motivation, you change the theory and you consider some uh, n equal one uh, supersymmetric young mills in 10 dimensions? Instead of uh, four dimensional young mills you had before. That's true. So, so you have many extra fields and somehow you change, uh, you change the theory, right? Well, I'm using a different theory to describe exactly the same configuration. And in a sense, the question is, where is that original theory? Where is the instanton, right? So I, I was aiming to describe just instanton and young mills with no other matter. And that instanton, if you like, is a theory on these parallel D5s. So from the point of view of the vertical D5 brains, these D3s appear as defects. And together, these two form an instanton. In fact, this picture is also quite insightful. People who studied periodic instantons or colorons, they observed that when you make coloron very large, it splits into monopole or anti-monopole pair. And these are exactly these D3 brains. D3 brain, from the point of view of D5, appears as, as a monopole. This and is a magnetic source. So when you say about periodic uh, instanton, you mean instanton on T4? No, it has only one, one direction periodic. So it is an instanton on R3 cross S1. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And that was essentially constructed by now. So this picture. But his construction, okay. It's, he gives exact solution modulo that you cannot solve some condition on periods of certain abelian intervals. So it's quasi solution. Am I right? Well, if you're interested in one color on, you can write it exactly. If you're interested in, in two colorons, then there is some elliptic constraint. So again, you can write exact solution, but the parameters involved in that solution satisfy an elliptic constraint. Oh, it's, it's elliptic in, in, in low genera, but actually, as far as I remember, num solutions are expressed in terms of certain spectral curve, and the spectral curve should satisfy the condition that periods of certain a billion exactly. integral, a I multiple know. of two. Yes, yes, exactly, exactly. And, and this and solution never can be, as far as I know, cannot be solved explicitly. It's transcendental equation. It's so, it's nice, but this is just to remember that exact solution means sometimes That's true. Can solve implicitly. Yes, thank you. Uh, thank you, Igor. This, this is a very good point. So in fact, in that business, this is called triviality constraint, triviality constraint on the spectral curve. And this, uh, this triviality constraint is the most non-trivial part of the whole story. And it's true, we, we don't know how to solve it except in, in, uh, in case of two. two instances. Uh, however, if you're interested in examples, indeed there are lots of higher rank examples in which case it can be solved. The generality is uh, difficult. Uh, so, in this story, there is yet another duality. We use T-duality of string theory. There is S-duality. S-duality interchanges NS5 and 
d5 grains and keeps d3 the same. So it interchanges this picture. From the point of view of this theory, it keeps the theory in the bulk the same, but it changes the defects. It changes by fundamental and fundamental defects. That symmetry, as a result, interchanges Coulomb and Higgs branches of the theory. And my statement is that this is the true mirror symmetry because now Coulomb and Higgs branches are interchanged, but they also isometric. They carry exactly the same metric. And if you have to compute this metric, you can use both. So let me now switch from this prelude to exact description of both. For concreteness, I'll, I'll focus on A-type bows, which describe instantons on multi-tailed knot. D-type bows would describe instantons on D-type space. So the, the bow can be encoded, A-type bow can be encoded in a circle in which you picked points, I'll call them P-points. That's a circle diagram. Then you take a pair of scissors and you cut it at this point. As a result, you will get a bunch of intervals and you connect intervals consecutively with arrows. As a result, you get a type bow. So the bow is simply a collection of intervals and arrows connecting them. A quiver was a collection of points and arrows and the bow is a collection of intervals and arrows. Just as the quiver, bow has its representation. To specify a representation of a bow, we need to specify some other points on the same circle. I call them lambda points. And you also specify a rank, that is rank function. That is an integer valued function, which is locally constant, and it can change only across lambda p points. And one extra bit of information is that if the rank does not change across some point, across some lambda point, then in addition, you give a one dimensional auxiliary space at that point. So that, that's what the representation is. This function R is the reincarnation of um, dimensions of vector spaces you assigned to the representation of the quiver. So now, we had our intervals, and these intervals are divided into subintervals by lambda points. And on each subinterval, there is certain rank. As a result, you can think of some, uh, some uh, permission bundle over each of those intervals. And then as, as a result also to the arrows, you can assign linear maps between them. So once you have a Bohr representation, you have an affine space. For each arrow, you give maps along the arrow and back, as indicated here. So these are arrows, uh, linear maps between the fibers at corresponding points. For each lambda point of constant rank, you assign maps between auxiliary space and that point. So all these arrows are very similar to what we have for quivers. And now, in addition to the story with quivers, we have these bundles over these intervals. So on these bundles, you now have non data. You have some connection and you have three endomorphisms. You can think of this in terms of quaternions as a connection on not on E, but on E tensor S, where S is some two dimensional representation of quaternions. Physically, these represent the young mills living in the bulk. So these are Higgs fields and this is the young mills connection. And this is the fundamental matter. That's why I call this fundamental space. And this is by fundamental matter. So you have this large affine space. It is hypercalar. It has action of quaternions on it. So you can see that we can multiply, uh, act on the left on this vector. And it's in some representation of quaternions. Q is also in representation of quaternions. And similarly, this is quaternionic object itself. Uh, Sirius, may I interrupt you? Yes, yes. Maybe question is right. So you described a picture for R3 cross S1, and this ball arises from this S1, S2. Is there a two, R2 
across this picture. I'm sorry, I missed the key uh, key part of this no, question. No, uh, actually, they could... are two cross T two? No, T one, just three dimensional. It's the different dimension. Yes, yes, indeed. because because that should be something like connection appearing in your slide in as one direction. I would like to see as a stationary hitching system that should indeed. be Absolutely. somewhere in hidden. Absolutely, no, you, you, you just guessed the answer. If you study periodic monopoles, that is monopoles on R2 cross S1, they are described in terms of a hitching system on a cylinder. And that, not that, exactly. It, it becomes a PDE. It is a connection rather than. Uh, it's PDE. not finite dimensional system. Exactly. Like it's not finite dimensional system. It is now Hitchin system on a cylinder. So there's a connection and there's a Higgs field. Mm -hmm. uh, and this is this is our result with Anton Kapustin on um, on periodic monopoles. Yeah. It would be interesting to compare with. Uh, Precisely this field generalization of Hitchin system, I proposed in 2002, but just for simple S1 cross, uh, a, a, actually across any uh, algebraic curve. Right, so for general algebraic curve, I wouldn't know uh, how to perform non transform, but if that, that curve is uh, is a torus or, or a cylinder, then I, I can have some statement. Yes, it would be very interesting. We, we, we should talk because I know how to do it for any algebraic curve. Well, that sounds really interesting. Yeah, we should definitely discuss it. Right, so but this, this, in a sense, is closer to the second step, it's closer to slings when kitchen system appears and various connections between different components appears. Uh, with bows, it's just an, an OD. And what I described is that, so we had a bow, we had bow representation, and now with bow representation, we associated the vector space. And this vector space carries the action of the gauge group. You can simply act on your bundle and the, this uh, whole elements in the vector space will transform in a natural way under this and then the gauge transformation. This gauge transformation respects the hyperkähler metric, so you can perform the hyperkähler reduction. And it comes as a result with a moment map, and you can view this in two different ways, either as hyperkähler reduction of this whole uh, vector space by a gauge group G, or as a complex symplectic reduction. You essentially fix the moment, three moment maps, and divide by the action of the group. In physics language, this moment map uh, complex and real parts uh, are called D and F flatness conditions. And uh, of course, in the end, you impose these conditions and divide by gauge group action. And, and, so, and gauge group is just some, some affine group in your case, yeah? Well, it would be exactly loop group if we wouldn't have by fundamental. So if this was the full circle. Uh -huh. What it appears now is that it even has different rank on different intervals. So it's, it has it's some SUR1 and then SUR2 and so forth. And it's all fit together. So it's, it's a... So it's a kind of a product product of uh, these loop factors, yeah? Like for ordinary quiver, you have product of uh, just simple factors. Uh, yes, and here we generalize it to map from a uh, set of intervals into, uh, let's say, product of these groups. Um, right, so uh, now I gave you the picture of a bow, but um, how do we turn it into mathematics? In a sense, now I would like this picture to emerge from analyzing instantons uh, properly. So we just, somebody gives me an instanton, how do I recover this picture now without appealing to string theory magic? Well, as it turns out, 
one has to redo quite a bit of analysis before this can be done. So for a second, let's look at instantons on R4. A decisive theorem of Ullenbeck states that the curvature of any instanton on R4 decays quartically, decays as R to the fourth. Like your instanton has to have finite action, that in, and self-duality implies this decay. So with, in our work with Mark Stern and Andres Larain Hubash, we had to establish some result like this, but for instance, on the top of not. As it turns out, that analysis is a little more subtle than on R4. And this change in dimension, um, in a sense, the change in volume growth is, uh, is changing analysis of decay rates of curvature substantially. The curvature is very sensitive to volume growth of the space. So the first, what we proved is that if you have finite action, then curvature decays at infinity. It actually norm goes to zero. Um, if you imagine that it behaves as a power, then this, this is evident, but there is no a priori reason why that should be. So that's just the first result. And second, most significant result is that the curvature decays quadratically in this case. So remember the volume, roughly speaking, a left space asymptotically looks like a three space and a circle, finite size circle, and volume growth is R cube, and it decays one over R squared, which is physically intuitive. That's the way charges behave in three dimensional space. Next, we prove that if so we have one technical assumption is that if you stand on some point in R3, there's a circle above it. If you have an instant, you can parallel transport around that circle. So as a result, there's, there's holonomy. What we presume is that this holonomy is regular. That is, if you head in along one of the rays in three-dimensional space to infinity, then this holonomy eigenvalues will have a limit and all eigenvalues are distinct. That's a technical assumption which makes analysis much simpler, which I believe can be dropped. I think both will still work, but the theorem at the moment is in this generic case. So if this happens for a single ray, that there's a limit of holonomy and it's, um, it's uh, in a holonomy is in regular orbit, then we prove that the connection, you can find the local uh, trivialization in some sector at infinity, so that your connection looks like, uh, well, it becomes diagonal up to corrections of this order. And each of these diagonal terms looks like an abelian instanton on multi tailed knot. What's important is that, well, there are these eigenvalues of holonomy that I already mentioned, and there are integers which look like monopole charges. And next part in our analysis is studying Dirac equation in the background of this uh, instanton. We prove that harmonic spinners, solutions of Dirac equation, decay exponentially if none of these lambdas is zero. That is, if we are in regular, if uh, the stabilizer of the holonomy at infinity is uh, maximum torus. And if this doesn't happen, then they decay quadratically. So now that we have it, we need one more result. We need to compute index of this Dirac quadrant. And we prove that this index can be expressed in terms of the orbit of the holonomy, magnetic charges, and the remaining action. And the way it is written at first, it's not clear that it's an integer at all. Because the space is non-compact, integral of f squared doesn't have to be an integer, nor is this first term. However, if you compute the corresponding term character, you find that, well, this term is purely topological. So it is a differential of uh, Chern Simon's term. And this term, you, you, you mean second term class simply, or it's Chern character? Well, would have been, uh, I, I use term character because, well, as a physicist, 
we usually use use the something related to the action so trace f squared and also i i don't impose that my group is special so it could be un but indeed you can relate it to the german class uh, so in terms of churn character integral of trace of squared uh, that is differential of churn simon's term and by uh, usual um, stokes theorem it's given by this integral over the boundary however this a doesn't have to be in the form we proved to relate it to the form we proved you have to perform some gauge transformation when you perform gauge transformation Chern Simon's form changes by a degree of that transformation. So there's that degree, and that is the instant on number. And then the remaining term is has a connection in that form, which we proved, which we can control. So when you compute that integral, you can exactly see what that contributes. When you assemble pieces together, so you plug that in our formula for index, you can see that the index indeed is an integer. What's important for us is that as you vary your class of connection, when that lambda crosses zero, the index will change by m, exactly. So when lambda j goes from negative to positive, then the index will change by the monopole charge. So these are the analytic results that we had to establish first. And once we have them, we can rederive the ball. So here's how we do it. First, I described to you those cigars in the Taub nut. There were the cycles. Each of these cycles will actually have a dual harmonic form. You can think of that harmonic form as an abelian instant on. You can write it quite explicitly on the Taub nut and compute its curvature and see that it's an instant. Moreover, Taub nut also has a one parameter family of L2 forms. So these forms play prominently in this generalizations of uh, ADHM construction found by uh, Kronheimer and Nakajima. And this is something specific to Taub nut. And next, what we do is we form a one parameter family of this abelian instantons together. You can add up these in any way you wish. But if you remember, we had a circle, and in the circle, we had various p points. Let's parameterize the circle by coordinate s. And I take my form, a naught, multiplied by s. And then whenever I cross a p point, I add corresponding abelian instant on a sigma associated with the corresponding cigar. So at the moment, it was arbitrary how we chose p points to lie in a circle. But once we have chose those, we have this one parameter family of instantons. Next, if somebody gives me a non-abelian instant on the knot with some bundle E, I can twist that connection by tensoring it with my family bundles ES. And essentially, I take my abelian instant on an add to it. So if, we, if you gave me an instant on, SUN instant on, I simply add U1 instant ons to it and consider a Dirac operator. So this Dirac operator is now a family parameterized by my circle, parameterized by S. I computed its index, and this index will give me the rank of the bow. Not only it will give me a rank, for every S, it will assign its kernel, L2 kernel of the Dirac operator. That's the fiber. So from the instanton, I obtained bow representation. And not only that, I get specific solutions, solutions of my moment map. So for every point on my circle, on my interval, I have the kernel. There is some subtlety. When we cross the lambda point, some of these forms, some of these harmonic spinners begin to diverge. And the rank, uh, that's where the index jumps. 
And the way it jumps is controlled by not L2 now, but bounded solutions of Laplace operator on my space. And these are the auxiliary spaces, which you might remember appeared in Bow representation. Next, if I pick some basis of this space is W and some basis of the kernel of Dirac operator, from those, I can induce a connection and my, uh, my Higgs field and the whole Bow solution. So from the instant on, I can recover solution of moment maps on the Bow. And that is what I call the down transform. We started in the four dimensions or on the tau nut and they ended up with one dimensional solution of the bow. If you want to go up, you start with the bow, you find some solution of the moment maps. Out of those, you construct what I call a one dimensional Dirac operator. Next, if you're interested in specific point on the top knot, that point can be parameterized by what I call a small bow representation. So T and B, so T, if you like, are those coordinates that I described in the beginning, radial coordinates, and B, B1 and B2, are coordinates on C2, which is just another coordinates on top nut. But the two are related by this formulas I gave in the beginning. So if you have this solution, the blue is completely fixed, and TB is a point on top nut. Again, you can combine the two Dirac operators, together by adding them. And now you have a family, family of Dirac operators on a bow, parameterized by position on top of nut. From this, you can induce the connection. The picture here is very similar from what we usually study in differential geometry. Like when you just start differential geometry, you don't, you don't learn this nonsense about patches that are glued together by transition functions and all that. You think of manifolds as lying in three-dimensional space or some other space. And once you have manifold in flat space, it has an immediately induced metric on it. Something similar happens here. Here, you have some solution of large bow representation and you had your tau nut, which you think of modular space of small bow representation. If you look at the kernel of Dirac operator associated to this, it knows nothing about the tau nut. It gives you a trivial bundle. But once you twist it, you have a non-trivial family. This family lies in simply all L2 sections of the bow. And as a result, these L2 sections form the trivial bundle. This kernel is a sub-bundle, so it has an induced connection. If you want to transport the vector, you just transport it in trivial bundle and project on the resulting space. And that's how instanton appears. It's the instanton on the kernel sub bundle. Now, I guess considering the time, I wouldn't describe this in more detail, but I'll just state the results of our- uh, Considering time, may I suggest you to have a continuation maybe after a couple of weeks? Just think about it. I have plenty, plenty to talk about if, if there's interest, of course. Um, I would be interested. I, 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 I would also prefer if you can suggest the maybe, problem. Maybe the in, 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 uh, instead mm -hmm. of missing uh, and trying to put all this stuff in the remaining 25 or so minutes, probably. Go slowly, and then you can see it will be happy to hear in the next day. Serge, is it possible? Sure, of course. Uh, can we come then two slides back? <laughs> yes. Because, <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, in fact, I, I can now give the whole talk backwards. From <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> Well, maybe it's a good idea. No, but uh, you had some uh, some bright green letters, and one of them I simply did not understand the meaning. But okay, so when you say uh, even here, so you say that so this is a bundle E over what? Over the tau nut. 
over the, over the top not yeah and so l and r who they are yes yes so uh we had these explicit functions or explicit one forms which are essentially abelian instantons this one um has zero integral over all other cigars and has integral one over the sigma cigar so it is tied to this Taubnat center. Okay, so you can think of this as a connection, as a billion instant on, on the bundle, which I call R sigma. Uh, excuse me, Sirius. Uh, you described at the beginning Taubnat space. Then you came to multi Taubnat combination with different sensors. And right now we are talking about uh instant on, on one tau knot or on a multi tau knot or what's the relation of centers of these tau knot cigars with this speed yes so uh, we are talking about instantons on multi tau knot the centers of tau knot are new one new two and so forth new k and then first observation is that every knot has a corresponding abelian instanton Right, now that I know that I have another, another opportunity to describe this, I will not have to pack it all in all so tightly and I can describe how these appear. All these can be understood in terms of a bow again. So if you start with, with a k bow, there were k intervals and k arrows between them. And you pick a representation which has no lambda points at all and has rank one everywhere. The modulus space of that will be the tau knot. And because it appears as hypercalar reduction, it will automatically come with bundles on it. Remember, hypercalar reduction is you take more level of moment map and then you divide by the group. But that group is U1 group acting on the bow. So what I'm describing here, this family, is exactly the family of connections which come on the tau knot understood as modulus space of small bow. Maybe next time I'll describe this in, in detail exactly how it emerges. But at the moment, we can simply know that these solve self-duality equations. And these are, these are discrete, there are no parameters here. You can just either have it or not. And then there is also one parameter family which solves uh, self-duality equations again. And then you can take any linear combination of those you wish. Okay, so, and then uh, when uh, to the slide where you had this uh, bright green extra letters. When we're transforming up here, yeah. So, uh, so here, so, uh, so what is this uh, at the very bottom? This curl D, probably, yeah. Yes. So let let's look at this bow, this bow representation. It has one interval, and it has an arrow connecting its ends. When you look at the corresponding space, you will have non data here, which are T's. T1, T2, T3. And you have maps, complex numbers, B10 and B01. And if you look at the moment map condition here at the end, it is exactly that relation between Q and T, that quaternion made out of Ts equals to quaternion uh, made out of Bs, quadratic expression in terms of Bs. So essentially, T1 plus IT2 will be equal to B10 times B01. So the, the main point is that the space of these solutions, modular gauge transformation, is a single tau knot. So the point on the tau knot 
is this set of T's. And B is related by this transformation. We can think of B's as coordinates on C cross C, T's as coordinates on top of not I described. And the moment maps is exactly this relation of switching from flat coordinates on C squared to radial coordinates. Okay, so this bright green letter signify a point on top of not, but thought of as moduli space of small ball representation. Well, so these are not yet bright, so the bright are probably on the next slide. Oh. Yeah, and where these now these uh, curl D operators, they just appear in this general formula, yeah? Yes, so the, the large ball representation had Dirac operator D, which I gave here. The small ball representation of the same ball, but small ball representation has similar little d Dirac operator. It has little t's here. It has little b's instead of b's, and it doesn't have q at all. And all we have to do is we tensor the corresponding bundle, bundle of the large representation, and strictly speaking, dual of bundle of small representation. And we add the two Dirac operators. In some way, this is a Fourier transform. This acts like momentum. So one can think of e to the i x p in, in Fourier transform as a, a kernel of a linear operator, uh, dd, ddx plus, plus ip. And that's that operator. We just shifted. Think of this as momentum. But the whole point was to start with something which encodes our instanton and then shift it by something which turns it into a family which depends on our space. And there are lots of important coincidences happening here, which has to do with either quaternionic structure or supersymmetry, depending on which physical or mathematical uh, view you take. And that is encoded in the miracle that d dagger d is quaternionic real operator. It commutes with all quaternions. But maybe again, next time I'll describe it in, in more detail. May, may I ask a stupid question? Uh, when ADH is or whatever, uh, data in cause instanton, they're given, there are some relations that makes the whole module space is quite non-linear. Non uh, what are, in, in your parameterization of instantons on uh, tau, tau not, uh, where are non-linear relations between various linear data? Exactly. These are, so, so two parts. Let's Flat conditions, you say, yeah? Yeah, these are the moment, moment map conditions. That's first part of the answer. Second, of course, what I described here should include ADHM because you can take any bow and send sizes of intervals to zero. It's kind of a special case of a bow. All intervals have zero size. It degenerates to a quiver. It also has this Dirac operator which is given by exactly the same expression, except it doesn't have this term. There's no connection left over because we shrunk the interval to zero size. These are exactly Bs and Ijs of the ADHM construction. And the condition that they satisfy algebraic equation is that D dagger D imaginary part is zero. You can see that it's quadratic expression in those Bs and Qs. Okay, thank you. thank you. But in our case, it becomes an ODE. And one can view Hitchin systems and monopoles in the same vein by some Dirac operator, and all non trivial conditions appear from requiring that D dagger D doesn't have imaginary part. Okay. Thank you. All right, so uh, 
But what, what time do I have now? I certainly ran over one hour. Well, I think you have 15 minutes more or so. Oh, very nice. So, uh, really, we would have an hour and a half. So, just having that in mind and having in mind that you have second talk, not scheduled yet. But... It's a very nice presence to the speaker. <laughs> Good. Um, so, maybe let me skip to the to describing the killer potential. Let me find this something quite remarkable. So in fact, one of my motivations to study all this is that bows naturally combine two Dinkin diagrams in one structure. If you look at UN Young Mills instantons on AKLF space, there are two Dinkin diagrams in the game. One has to do with the gauge group. And that is a fine A uh, N minus one Dinkin diagram. And the other has to do with the space. And the other fine diagram is essentially a fine version of the intersection matrix of the two cycles in the space. The bow, as you remember, the bow itself contains these P points, and it has to do with the diagram encoding the space. But then there were these lambda points, their number was equal to the rank of the group. So when you look at the bow representation, instead of just the bow, then the bow itself encoded AK minus one, and the representation knew about the gauge group. So there's one diagram, position of P points have to do with space, position of lambda points have to do with a type diagram of the, of the gauge group. So every interval corresponds to a dot in the diagram and every lambda point corresponds to the, the edge in the diagram. If you try to study the dynamics, so I was not very explicit about writing moment maps, but if you look at moment map on each interval, then it is a vanishing of the moment map is exactly given by the NAM equations. NAM equations, in my view, is the most beautiful system of ODs you can write. You have three matrices, uh, they depend on S, and derivative of one is commutator of the other two. It doesn't get any more symmetric or beautiful, I think. Because this is an integrable system, it has a lax form, like so, where L matrix is quadratic in Ts. And as a result, the eigenvalues of this matrix do not depend on S, and that defines the spectral curve. Um, so uh, re returning to my old question, in usual NAM system, you the constraint on the curve that the corresponding solution should be periodic that puts some equations on on periods of certain integrals and so on. Uh, in your case, the solution are not smooth; they are jumping from point to point, right? This yes. piece. Yes, but anyway, so, in a very yes. So what, what are new constraints of the spectral curve? I'm about to give them explicit. So uh, first let's describe the curve. So, sorry, a question, Sergey. Uh, is it indeed M, uh, the, the expression for M, does it indeed contain D over DS or? Yes. Yes. Oh, 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 I'm sorry. Yes, is it? So, yeah. yeah. Uh, uh, One of these DDS's DD, DD, DD should disappear. Thank you. Uh, My fault. Yeah, so let's get rid of, uh, let's get rid of this one. So the, the moral at the moment is that each sub-interval 
has its own spectral term. Okay. Next, let's see what's happening at a P point where there is bifundamental maps. That has to do with another moment map condition, gauge group action on the P point to the left or to the right of the edge. That condition simply tell us that L, the, the matrix which gives us the spectral curve, part of the lax matrix, factorizes this product of Bs, certain combination of Bs. And the condition on the other side tells us that it factorizes in terms of the same Bs, but given in the opposite order. Right? Let's say this matrix maps us from right to left and this left to right. So if you want to get something on the right, you can have to put them in this order. And if you have to get something on the left, you put them in the opposite order. Now, if you have matrices A, B, and B, A, then- it, 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 it looks like a discrete isomonodromy transform exactly. of, the spectral, of, of the spectral, uh, spectral curve, is it? Yes? Well, in this case, spectral curve simply will not change. If it has, if they have the same rank, if these are square matrices, then the two spectral curves on the two sides will be exactly the same. Yes. The, 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 the bundle will jump. Exactly. So the bundle changes, right? Bundle changes again in somewhat controlled fashion and the spectral curve remains the same. So what we learn surprisingly is that P points what they what defined our bow, but spectral curves don't care. Spectral curve goes through P points without change. It only changes when you cross lambda points. So as a result, spectral curves live at the vertices of a reciprocal bow, not the original bow, but bow determined by the representation by lambda points only. So as a result, if you look at this reciprocal bow, if you instead of cutting at P points the way we did until now, if you cut at lambda points, you will get a type diagram where every vertex has its own spectral curve. So you have Dinkin diagram, a fine version of Dinkin diagram of the gauge group, and each vertex has its own spectral curve. Now the edges, that is which, which of the spectral curves are adjacent, are very important in what's coming next. But also we have the moment maps. Remember when we went from here to here, indeed spectral curve didn't change, but there was some moment map assigned to it, which, which had corresponded to position of our nut. That curve, that moment map itself is encoded in auxiliary spectral curve, which is just a section of TP1. So at some of the vertices, namely if there is P point on corresponding lambda interval, then there are also this auxiliary spheres, Riemann spheres, uh, which simply encode the positions of the, of the nuts. So the moral is that every nut talks to only one of the spectral curves. There could be few of them talking to only one spectral curve. But there is a... Uh, spectral curve or monodromic curve corresponding to this transformation around the whole loop. So do you know anything about it? So go around the whole circle now, it's polygon. Then you come to the end. So there would be monodromy. Well, there, is, uh, there is a spectral curve of this monodromy. The problem is that it's not continuous, we have, we have to jump from one fiber to another using by fundamental maps. So there is no continuous monodromy as you go around. In fact, some of the it, ranks- It, it is a monodromy of discrete, trans periodic discrete uh, transformation. Well, in that case, I would say you have two monodromies. You can parallel transport along interval, then use B along the arrow and gate transform use another B and so forth. What you get as a result is analogous to, uh, to Bs in the corresponding ADHM construction. Uh, 
except in this case, ranks might jump. We might even have a case where on one of the intervals, you have zero rank. So there's no way to transport it at all. That's what I call Cheshire bow. Um, but indeed, what you describe is one of the projections, product of all of the Bs with corresponding conjugations. And then if you go the other direction, you will get product of Bs in the other, uh, product of the other Bs in the other direction. Uh, except it's no longer in the group itself. It's some, some endomorphic. It doesn't have to be invertible. Okay, so let me now package this whole information that <clears throat> we had a fine uh, Dinkin diagram of the gauge group to each vertex the, uh, there is assigned a spectral curve corresponding to non data, and maybe some spheres, some P1s, corresponding to, uh, to the knots, positions of the knots. And all of these sit in exactly the same TP1. That's where all spectral curves were defined. So now, for all these curves, my diagram tells me that if two edges are connected, if two vertices are connected by an edge, then indeed these intersections of the curves count, and I should consider them as intersecting. But if they are not connected by an edge, even though they sit in the same TP1, I ignore the intersection. So you can think of the result as some reduced spectral curve with various components. And on that curve, we write this function. So we integrate the various cycles that I'm about to specify. And the cycles are given by, encoded in this intersection that we described. Oh, let me see. Right, so each of these terms here, so we, we live in TP1. A zeta will be usual Riemann coordinates on P1, and eta will be coordinates and coordinates in the tangent plane in the fiber of TP1. So then if two curves intersect, then we take the difference of their uh, values in the in the fiber of the TP1 and write this expression and write this integral. And if there is some auxiliary P1, then we write exactly the same expression in this interval. So in fact, this whole well, mess- the, integra the integration contour is what, what is gamma E? So I'm about to specify the integration contour. So essentially integration contour goes along the red curve and then through the intersection point and through the blue curve. So I'm just about to specify integration contour. So it goes on the cycles connecting the two curves if the curves are connected by an edge in the Dinkin diagram. If not, then you don't include these contours at all. And also if my moment uh, map- Excuse me, I'm for all the interruptions, but can this collection of curves can be seen as degeneration of some smooth curves that becomes degenerate and singular in the degeneration? So is there anything above that is smooth? I wish to know the answer to this question. I do. It, it looks very much as a result of a certain degeneration procedure. Yes. When some smooth spectral curve degenerate to a singular one and what you are describing are some connected components of normalization. Yes, yes. And I would love to have interpretation for that smooth curve, but I do not. I do not. Maybe there is some, well, no, I, I, do, I do not know the answer to this question. Okay, okay. Independent of your next talk, <laughs> I would like to have a Zoom meeting to discuss with you personally. Yes, yes, yes. yes, 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 yes. Okay, I'm sorry, I have to leave for some reason. Uh, 
Is it a good point to to stop at certain moment and continue with more details later? This is the moment. So um, to conclude, we have. Um... It's, may, it's maybe not a very good point, just because uh, where from this idea comes, uh, why you get the killer potential in that way. Oh yes, that's right. That's right. So <clears throat> this actually involves a fairly non-trivial calculation that we've done with Roger Bilavsky. That is. There is a, a twister space associated with this whole space. And on the twister space, there is symplectic form, which is written in terms of monodrome as parallel transports along each interval in the bow and L. So if you like, H is an integral of, M, you take lax pair, M and L. L is here and H is essentially integral of M. So, from in certain sense, it's a, it's a solution of some your auxiliary uh, linear problems. Exactly. So from solution of auxiliary linear problem, you can write the, the symplectic form on that. And from symplectic form, you can see how it is encoded in the spectral curve. Uh, uh, it's a, it has spectral curve and very specific bundle on it, just as for monopoles. So TP1 had very special bundle on it whose transition function was e to the eight over zeta. And that is the linear flow of this integrable system. And from that, we can read off the Keller potential. So you, you take this, write it in Darbu coordinates. And from Darbu coordinates, you can see that uh, the whole Keller potential is encoded in one single function. This formula looks very similar to what I like to write as a universal form on, on lux operators. It's pretty much it's, it looks similar. Well, there's only so many things which make <laughs> which make sense right? for a specific integral system. But yes, it would be really, really interesting to compare, and especially if there's any other techniques that can be used here to extract it. But essentially, this observation was in uh, in kitchen. Calcadic instrument Rochek, and has to do with the generalized Legendre transform. Um, in fact, it was discovered not by hyperkeller methods at first, by, by simply writing supersymmetric Lagrangians, encoding them in a single function. Uh, the last stupid question. This form you wrote looks like a linear form in, in a theory of integrable systems. But there are also, but log in your answer suggests that there should be a group version of this form. Am I, I always missing? thought of this log as, as a bit of a cheat. Log is there to keep track on what sheet we are on. So essentially when we go around, around the cut one way or another, then this mm -hmm. log is there only to give me two pi to know that I went around non-trivial loop. Because log appears when you're dealing with discrete system and the corresponding uh, form is, is, uh, is rather I, quadratic. Yeah. Igor, I don't understand because there we have dh over h in omega, yeah? Uh, dh. So we have. No, no, no. It, it should be dl over l. That dh over h is. is, is 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 just tangent vector to your field. What well, DL over L inverse would be the second form, which usually manifested by log term e, e, in in integrals. It is interesting to compare. Yes, and something like this appears if you try to get spectral curve for for this twisted spectral curve for periodic monopoles. But whenever I try to do that, well, I have a paper which just poses a question about this since I couldn't find the answer. It's called the journey. Uh, between... Actually, there are two forms. One involves L and the other logarithmic derivative. In, you just replace in, in the formula you wrote something like logarithmic derivative of L. That would be another. In classical integrable systems, there are two. It's by, by Hamiltonian structure, whatever you call it. But there are two forms, and one is more uh, natural for a linear system, the other for group 
interpreted. Right. So, so this this uh, story journey between two curves asks exactly a similar question. If there is this formalism for multiplicative system, um, and that has to do with spectral curves for periodic monopoles, and that would be a very powerful tool, but unfortunately at the moment there is no, no result there. So we don't know the historical description of periodic monopoles. In fact, it relates directly to to Misha's talk last week with uh, how to relate all this to, to Zastavas, um, which appear for one special complex structure. And this view that I'm describing here includes all complex structures. So in one of those complex structures, indeed, there would be, uh, so, but it's generalization of this problem. It's now looking at slings and spectral description for those, and it inevitably will have a multiplicative structure here. Yes, we should definitely keep it. Um, right, so I'll get to the conclusions that uh, Bow model spaces first give very specific statement about uh, supersymmetric gauge theory, mirror symmetry. And this mirror symmetry now becomes exact. It's not only the level of algebraic geometry, it's the level of differential geometry. The, the, Higgs and Coulomb branches are isometric and exchanged. Uh, Bow construction delivers in its current form all instantons on a left spaces, except at the moment we impose this condition of asymptotic holonomy, but I believe if you allow your lambda points to have multiplicities, then it answers the general question. This is a theorem, this is not yet. And then it allows to compute First, asymptotic metrics that I didn't describe today, but one can get explicit asymptotic metrics when instantons are far separated from each other. Um, and it also gives exact scalar potential in this space. Except, just as Igor mentioned, I gave you this function, but this function has to satisfy certain constraints. And that's how you reduce, when you perform this general as the genre transform, you impose constraints and also change coordinates on the genre. So as a result, you have some number of coordinates for which you have to solve using these constraints. These constraints, as you can see from this expression, are conditions on some period. So the curve, so they are transcendental and not so pleasant to deal with. All right, so, uh, and I should also mention that all these tools can be used to construct explicit solutions. For example, I used it to compute explicitly one instant on on, on uh, tau nut uh, in the generic position. And uh, also they can be used to construct, for example, uh, uh, Toft-Polikov monopole in the presence of arbitrary number of singularities that involved Cheshire bows. And that's, that's our work with uh, Brian Durkan and with um, Chris Blair. And so I'll, I'll stop here. Thank you. Questions? Probably I asked too many. Uh, so, sir, may I ask uh, about uh, uh, the very first uh, uh, table? Yes. So, uh, uh, what uh, were that uh, decorated neutron polygons? Uh, uh, did they, uh, so, basically, what is the decoration? Uh, are there some partitions of uh, sides of uh, these polygons or, or not? Yes, yes, that's right. Um, so, this has a uh, um, I described this in detail in, in my paper on monopole walls, with doubly periodic monopoles. There's one paper with Ward and one paper after that. And essentially, if you look at the monopole on R cross T2, then uh, if you go far to the left, it essentially gives you constant magnetic fields in each component of UN. If you go far to the right, it gives you constant magnetic fields in other splitting of UN. And these have to do with slopes of some Newton polygon. So all this charge data and singularities of a monopole, they're organized into Newton polygon. And they in turn can have various degenerations. So you have to take Newton polygon and along this edge, you put some vertices which are, well, essentially that's what you said, is a partition of, of the, each edge. 
thank you uh, so and and as an uh, 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 spectral curve uh, related to this uh, neutron polygon uh, APS uh, uh, anywhere uh, yes there are two types of curves associated with this polygon uh, and that's exactly what we used with uh, with Richard uh, to describe the the space and the deformation theory of these um, so there are Essentially, you take a uh, holonomy around one or the other direction of the torus, and using that, you can construct what they call Higgs spectral curve. These curves are easy to write, and they determine this Newton polygon. But in addition, there is a twistorial curve, and that is harder to describe, but that curve as a reward, it gives you the metric on the modulus space. So that curve is analog of this curve that I used today. And this paper long while ago, a journey between two curves, it poses exactly this question. How is the twistorial curve related to this curve, which is described by the Newton polygon? That, that's an open question, but it's a question worth a, which is worth a lot because it gives you, if you know that curve, then you can construct metrics, you can construct solutions. Thank you. And so, is, is there an explicit way to write down lux operator which gives this decorate Newton polygon, which gives curve uh, with this Newton polygon? Uh, yes. And uh, uh, in fact, this tune, his collaborators uh, used it uh, to write it quite explicitly. Uh, and essentially, this, these are the methods, methods they use are in the book of Semenov Tinshansky and uh, uh, Reiner. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. Thank you. So, uh, is there any degeneration uh, from this uh, story with Newton polygons to both uh, varieties uh, or not? Oh, that's an excellent question. So, to go way to bow varieties, you have to first degenerate to, to slings and then to bows. Um, yes, so there, there must be. If you have any doubly periodic monopole, you can take one of the circles and uh, open it up. And this relates to the sort of tropical description of asymptotics that I used before. But this is something that definitely is worth studying. It's not something which, is, um, which has been fully explored. Thank you. OK. If there are no more questions, then just thank speaker again. And sorry for interruptions and for additional work you need to do to give a next talk. Oh, the interruptions were the best part of the talk. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, I'm sorry. I may ask you to send your slides somewhere. An email then. Ну, я тоже хотел попросить, то просто, может быть, ну, можно просто мне по почте послать там или. Okay. I'll email. Yes. Okay. Спасибо. Спасибо.